SJC 12875, Commonwealth v. Francis X. Harding, Jr. Uh, Mr. Tennant, you may proceed. Um, thank you. Good morning. May it please the Court, Eric Tennant. On behalf of Mr. Harding, um, and with me on the phone is Mike Farrington, who was the uh, attorney below. Uh, like so many people, unlike so many registered persons, Mr. Harding ran a business out of his home. He did it for years and years and years. And although he provided services outside of the home, his place of employment was always his home. Harding was what we refer to as self-employed. And for people like him, sometimes registration can be confusing. The statute defines employment in terms of time. You are employed for registration purposes based on how long or how little you work somewhere. But when you provide services in different places, that can be a little confusing. That's why he registered his home address as his place of employment. First, the SOAR form actually allows for that, that for someone to register as self-employed. Um, and secondly, no one ever thought this was wrong. His lawyer counseled him this was the way to do it, and his probation officer was well aware that this is how he was registering. Uh, the legislature, I suppose, could have defined employment for registration purposes in some other way. It could have defined it based on what you do, not how long you do it. Um, that's how it set parameters in other uh, contexts and where employment needs to be defined, and where it's defined based on the services you provide. Um, and had they defined it that way, he may well have had to register the address where he provided services. Um, but that would be, in this context, a little absurd, burdensome, and really impossible to manage. And so the legislature defines employment based on timing, um, and it makes sense that someone should only register an employment address that has a little more permanence, and for someone like Harding, that was his home where he was self-employed. Requiring anything else creates several problems, including two big ones, one general and one specific to this case. Generally, it really makes it virtually impossible for anyone to comply with. If you have to register a place where you provide services for 10 days in a row, when do you register that address, especially if you don't know how long a job is going to be? Do you do it on day one? But if you only work eight days, then what? Do it on day 10, and then on day 11 when you're done, you now have to unregister. It becomes unwieldy. Then a specific problem in this case um, is that Mr. Harding could not have possibly known about this in the in the facts of this case, um, and the Commonwealth concedes this point uh, that he, this is not a, couldn't have been a knowingly violation uh, because there was no way he had noticed since he had advice from uh, from his lawyer saying otherwise, and because the probation office was aware of this and they didn't tell him it was erroneous, nor did they ever contact um, uh, toward themselves to um, indicate otherwise. Uh, secondly, uh, and briefly, the, the second condition, um, I, I uh, uh, would submit that the judge erred in finding that he violated probation by working with children. Um, and it's important to know that the condition was always that he not, quote, work, volunteer, reside with children, end quote. The notice of the violation, and this is the theory the judge seemed to adopt, said that he violated the condition of working, quote, where children are present. And those are not the same thing. Working with children means something different than working where children are present. Um, and if you read the condition as it was written and intended, it's clear that uh, there was no factual or legal basis to say he violated that condition here. Um, and, and there are similar arguments here um, with, the, with, the, with the first issue in terms of what does it mean, how do you interpret this, um, and what the parameters are. And, and I think when you read that in context, it's clear that he didn't violate this condition either. Um, at, at this point, I guess I would open it up to any questions from the court. Okay, before we do that, if anybody who is not speaking has not muted their phone, please do. Uh, there was background noise then. Uh, Justice Link, you may proceed. Yes, hi, thanks, Mr. Tennant. Um, good morning. Um, our question has to do with the fact that if the Commonwealth has conceded the point that he did not knowingly, there was not sufficient evidence to prove that he knowingly failed to register his employment in Lynn, does that, say, does that moot out one of these things, one of the convictions? I think it does. Um, uh, you know, the, the, this court took uh, direct appellate review. I don't know if it was aware of that or not. Um, I think it moots it out in terms of the finding. I think this court can and still should provide some guidance about what people in Mr. Harding's situation can or should do um, moving forward. 
Yeah, that doesn't do anything to the other conviction, I take it, to the one having to do with the child? Correct. They're separate, they're separate issues. I agree with that. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. This is Gaziano. Uh, a quick question. Looking at the judge's findings, um, was the judge basically finding that he was engaged in separate instances of employment so that if he exceeded the requisite number of days uh, at one particular job site, he was uh, employed by that family who owned the Lynn home? And that's so they use a definition of employment to transcribe it to uh, workplace. Is that your read of what the judge did? I think it has to be, um, Judge Graziano, because that's the only way it makes sense that the judge was just adding up and saying, well, here you were more than X number of times that the statute says, so I'm going to say that you were employed there, right, by this family, uh, you know, at this house. That was your employer. I think that's the only way to read what the judge did here. Right. So it, 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 in what way, um, if at all, do we use the definition of employment and help us tease out what the legislature meant? By uh, uh, place of employment. Uh, work, I'm sorry. So, by work work address. I'm sorry. Sure. I, the problem is, I think the definition only gets you so far. It doesn't answer the question here, um, and so you have to look at other things. You have to look at a little bit of context. Um, it does define it based on time, not what you do. I think that's the first important thing. Um, so that it's looking for something a little more permanent. It doesn't want people to register if they work some, if they provide services, you know, one day here or one day there. So that's the first clue I think you have. Um, and you also have to look at the fact that you can register as self-employed. Um, and, and so you start putting these things together, and I, I think the best interpretation you can give based on what little we have from the legislature is that there are some instances in which people don't have to register places where they provide service regardless of how long they do it if that is really not where they're employed. If, if they're, if they're self-employed and their center of business is somewhere else, then they don't have to register every time they go out and do something related to that job. And, and, and the next question is, the final one I have is when when when, the, when your client provided the invoices to show that he was employed to the probation officer. I assume that they they were invoices. You know, I'm doing the window job at this house, and the next month perhaps the same invoice for the same job site. So there's no there's no surprise that he was doing extended uh, carpentry services for, for for people past the 14 days. Correct. Correct, and, and some of those invoices, I think all of those invoices, um, are in the re in the appendix yeah, itself. And so with it. Yeah, they're in the appendix, right? Yeah, and so you can see the address of the home where he was providing the services, and you can see a description of what those services were. Okay. And then there's a date of an invoice. Great, thank that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Justice Louie. Mr. Tennant, good morning. Um, good morning. I know that... These are not uh, your facts, but if you have an uh, um, individual who's self-employed and does construction, employed in, in Newton, that's where his office is, um, but he's building an addition at a house in Lynn, and he knows he's going to be there for four months building the addition, um, in that circumstance, would he need, in your view, to have to register that he was working in Lynn as well? I don't think so, and and I think it gets back to um, the the way in which um, uh, the legislature chose to um, define work for these for this situation versus something else. He's providing services somewhere other than where he's self-employed. I agree with that, and he's providing services for a time period longer than what the the statute defines as work. But that's not that's not where he's employed. Um, and that's what the statute is really getting at. Um, so I don't think in that, even in that situation, he would have to provide, or he would have to register the address where he's providing those services. Okay. Um, now, one last question. Um, the condition of working with children, um, yes. um, you, you suggest that, that that means a job where you're working with children, not, not that children are present. But if you had a, uh, a carpenter, uh, who was working um, at a location where there were, you know, teenagers coming home after work, uh, turnkey, uh, and the carpenters in there, uh, he might be violating a different condition of probation if he has to stay away from children. Would you agree with that? 
with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Justice Bud. Good morning. Um, morning. For the first issue, uh, I'm just trying to figure out, doesn't your definition or the way you, you're defining or the way you're interpreting um, employment defeat the purpose of listing the places of employment uh, if they're 14 or more consecutive days or, or 30 days total? Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I, I do know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. <laughs> My answer, I guess, will tell you whether I know what you mean. All right. Um, I, <laughs> so I, I, I don't think it's possible, or I think the legislature made a decision to say, you know, it, it can't, it's not going to be possible for people to register literally everywhere they provide services in some situations, um, and, and nor, you know, do we even want that? Do we want, you know, someone registering a home that they're worked at, provided some services at for one day, and now that family has their home published publicly as a place of employment when that's not really what it is? So the legislature had to make a decision about what, you know, how how to navigate this, and they did, I think, the best they could because any other interpretation really makes us unwieldy. And and the other thing I think that um, is sort of a, a fail-safe here is they have Internet dissemination, um, and despite what I may think of that, that is a fail-safe, which is you can still look somebody up by name. You don't have to look them up by address. And so Mr. Harding is a good example. He's a level three, and if you looked him up by name, you would find his status. He doesn't need to register everywhere he provides services for that to be available. So I think the, regis the legislature sort of puts the scheme as a whole to say, in some way or another, we will capture this, but we're not going to capture in a way that makes them unburdensome or impossible for the registrant, um, and, and really <laughs> unburdensome, uh, burdensome to the place in which he's providing services, you know, in this case, for example, the home and live. Uh, I'm still trying to puzzle this out because didn't the legislature, and like you said, they, the legislature made a determination that, well, we're not going to do it for one day. We're not going to do it, you know, if he's there for a couple of days, we'll do it if the person is going to be there for 14 or more consecutive days or if they end up being um, – being there over 30 days for a calendar year. So, I mean, isn't that just what the statute, isn't that just what it says? Don't you just do what it says? So I think the problem is it becomes unworkable, and when it becomes unworkable, you have to take a step back and say, what were they trying to say? And what they were trying to say is what we're really looking for is for people to register um, places where they essentially permanently work. Um, and not where they provide services. So that time period tells us that they were trying what they were trying to capture. I'm trying. What's the difference between doing work and performing services? Where where somebody actually works and where somebody performs services? Because so when I say doing work, what I mean by that employed in terms of how I think the statute defines it. Because there's many people who are you know self-employed and they run their business out of the house, but they have to travel out of the house to do things. Okay. Um, again. As a, I think a great example is I'm oh, a lawyer. I understand your, your example as a lawyer and going to court. I, I think that's a little different, but I, I do I, I take your point there. Were you going to give me another example? That's not um, papers, because I, I did see that. Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, I think the example keep going. For you know, you have people who do landscaping, you have people who do you know contracting work like Mr. Harding does, um, and, and to say that they're employed uh, at the places where they're providing these services, I think, does not capture what the statute is trying to capture. That's why I use the difference: providing services versus employed. Um, that they're providing services. Um, in different locations, but no one would say that these families are their employers uh, in, in any stretch of the imagination. Okay. And then, with regard to the second um, violation, I, you know, I, <laughs> I just want to. I, I know I, I was a superior court judge and did this stuff, but don't you? Do, does a judge create the conditions based on the circumstances, or are there? I, they're not boilerplate conditions, right? So a judge will say, well, given the situation, given the um, uh, what he's what he's pled guilty to, and and the circumstances of that, here are the conditions I'm going to put on his probation. Isn't that isn't that fair? 
I think that's certainly the way it's supposed to be. I can't say that it's never um, boilerplate, but yes, context matters. I, I agree with that. Um, at least in, when you're trying to figure out what does this condition for this person mean. Right, right, um, right. And, and, and the cases <laughs> uh, that I think we're all um, uh, thinking about when we think about this issue go to that too. What, what what was going on in this person's underlying conviction that creates this condition, and what notice did he have, therefore? Um, that this condition prohibited A, B, or C. Um, so the the and so what you have here contextually, um, uh, and actually, and I, I reread the record many times, and the record actually doesn't um, uh, have much uh, in the way of, of saying what the context of the condition was. Um, but I don't think anyone was under the impression that the offending occurred um, in, in any context related to the kind of work that he was doing. Um, from what I know about the case, this was a, an offense that took place at the home against um, the grandchildren of his then wife. Okay. Um, so for someone to have that that offending behavior and then read this condition to mean or, or to even to think that it means, well, I can't provide, I can't do some work on the outside of a house if there's a supervised child on the inside, I think is a, a bridge too far. Okay, thank you. Justice Schaefer. Thank you. Good morning. Um, morning. Do you know where where we are? Um, are we consistent with other states in the way this has been interpreted, or have you seen any other states interpreting this in any particular um, way? Or yeah, I, I wish um, I wish I had a better answer. I, I looked. I really did look as hard as I could to see if I could find this issue playing out anywhere else, either at the state or federal level. I personally came up empty-handed. Doesn't mean it's not out there. It just means that yeah. I, I can't answer that question because I, I couldn't find anything. Um, but maybe one of you know, okay. you guys have great law clerks. And maybe they could find something I missed. <laughs> well, they are great law clerks, but it's not there. Um, oh, okay. One other question is uh, related more to your experience, uh, and so it's I guess outside the record. But um, have you sure. seen a lot of these kinds of cases? Or is there a lot of this? Sort of case. Meaning, meaning people being yeah. uh, violated. I mean, I, I can tell you. No, no, but they get violated all the time. I know that. But I mean, in terms of this particular kind of work oh, yeah. uh, situation. Um, sure. Anecdotally, I can tell you absolutely, and I have clients in similar positions, and, and I have to tell you quite honestly that I advise them the same way Mr. Harding was advised here, because um, that's my that has been my interpretation of it. Um, so there are a lot of people who are self-employed who essentially run their business out of their home, but they have a job that requires them to leave the home to provide services similar to Mr. Harding. Maybe it's landscaping, maybe it's snow removal, maybe it's... Or know, some kind of delivery uh, service that comes every delivery week. Delivery service, you know, yeah. driving a truck, uh, okay. driving a delivery truck, something like that. Um, that that's not All uncommon. Right. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mrs. Kafka. Um, I, I find this very difficult. So I'm, I'm trying to understand. So, and it's a combination of Justice Rowley's and Justice Budd's question. So, I, you've got some handyman, or again, a self-employed con construction worker, and they're in your house for a month, um, and they know they're going to be there a month. It. Aren't we creating a danger here if these people don't have to report? Because they, they meet the statutory definition, right, clearly. Their employment includes employment that is full-time or part-time for a period of time exceeding 14 days or for an aggregate period of time exceeding 30 days. Um, so, I mean, Justice Lowy's hypothetical. You've got someone, and again, I'm distinguishing a landscape company, which is a, a whole company, but a, an individual employer, you know, a self-employed individual, they're sure. working in my house for 30 days, and I've got young kids. Isn't, isn't that what the statute's directed at? So I, 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 I'd push back a little bit and say I, I think when you start to try and figure out what the statute was getting at, it's not. It, it, it can't possibly, or wasn't possibly intended to capture that. Um, Why not? Because, Why not? Because 
um, of the impossibility of complying with it. So some of the hypotheticals I gave, um, at what point would Mr. Harding have had to register here? Does he do it on the first day if he's not sure he's going to be working for more than 10 days? Does he do it on day 10? And if he finishes on day 11, is he only registered for one day and then it comes off? Is it always so considered take, a place of enforcement? Take Justice Lowy's hypothetical. It's a big job. Um, he's going to build a deck for somebody or some something he knows he can't do um, in less than a couple of weeks. And they've got five little kids. Um, that, that, he doesn't have to register there. I mean, I understand it's burdensome, but it just seems like the legislature put in these day requirements. I'd be more comfortable if it said full-time, but... Um, but in Justice always hypothetical, you're there for four months and they got children and you don't have to, because it, and it's not like your guy where he has a carpentry thing in his house. He just, that's what he does. He goes to your house and fixes it. Right. I, no, I, I understand the hypothetical. I, I just don't think that um, the way the staff shoot was crafted that it, um, it, in, it, it, could capture that, meaning if it's not looking for people to register when they're providing services for less than that, then it's not looking for them to register when they're providing services for more than those days if they're in their place of employment, their self employment is somewhere else, if that's not where they permanently but, work. But they don't but but they don't really have his place of employment is where he's employed. I go you know, he's a handyman. He says, I'm coming I'll come to your house and fix it. That's he doesn't have a he doesn't have a workshop at his house or something. He, I, I understand he's different from your person, but right, we got no, a, no, we got a lot. We we don't want sex offenders in people's homes for long periods of time, do we? Unless so, they're registered. You know. So I, I think the problem is you're you're talking about employment colloquially, and we have to talk about how the legislator legislature could define it for these purposes of registration, and they chose chose to define it in a way that will, at some point, um, have people providing services in, pl in addresses that are not registered. That's why there are other things in place to perhaps capture that, and uh, one of that is, you know, internet dissemination or, or dissemination of information in other formats that are not related to an address. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, if you look at the, the, the registration form, for example, it has a, an option for self-employed. And so Could, people give me thing, give me an example of something that would meet. I mean, we got to make some sense of the statute, right? Give me one where describe something that would be covered that's 14 days or 30 days. It, it seems like you're reading out the entire language. Give me something that would meet that definition that would satisfy it. I, I'm not reading out the entire language. What I'm trying to figure out, or I'm trying no, give, to tell me a job out. that would. Tell me a job to meet this requirement. Sure. My, my job. I am employed at 50 Congress Street, and if I had to register, this is the address I would have to register. Uh, but but you know, you're, there, you're there 360 days a year. Give me an example of something with 14 but, days or 30 days. But I'm, but I'm not. I'm, I'm here some days, especially nowadays, I'm barely here. You know, I'm working four, four and a half days of the week in my office, but I still consider well, my, entire in my home. <laughs> but oh, I still consider myself that. employed here. I, there are days where I, you know, I'll, I'll be on trial for two weeks out of county, and I'm not in my office. So there, you know, most jobs, most people are not self-employed. Most people have. No, but, I, but I, again, I'm, I'm trying to make to. the statute. The statute has to make some sense. Give me something that's covered by this. Where, why would they pick a 14 day or a 30 day? Tell me a job that's legitimately covered by this. Because I think you're reading out everything that meets this definition. What, what, uh, I think the problem is what we're really, what, what we're trying to figure out is which address do you have to register? So everyone who works has to register some address. The question is which? And, and and that's that's the thing. Not that he doesn't have to register. It's just which address does he register? 
if if someone works at a restaurant and and that is where they work and they're a cook, they're not a delivery, but they're a cook. They work at that register at that restaurant. It, but if someone you know drives um, you know for Grubhub and they pick up uh, meals from that restaurant to deliver to places, they do not work at that restaurant. So which address would people have to register? The cook would register that restaurant. The driver would register wherever he he you know keeps track of bills and and takes calls and things like that. So that's what we're talking about. Which address do you register? Not not you know everybody has to register. So where? Which one? Which address do you register on this scheme? So your view is this reads, everyone has to put one address down. Um, uh, okay. Um, well, no, I suppose there's people question. who work two jobs, but, every, but you know, but, yes, you have to put an address of, of where you work. If you have two jobs, you put two addresses. But depending on your job, you may not have to put everywhere in which you're doing your job. But it, okay. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Uh, I've got some questions. So, uh, <clears throat> what do you say the 14 days and the 30 days means? The amicus says it should be it should be uh, declared void for days. Uh, are you saying that we can craft a definition which would spare us from the need to do that? I, I do, and and. What I say is, on its face, it's not clear what it means. Um, and, and so the best you can do is, is take the context of it and try and figure out what the legislature was trying to accomplish with it. And it's what, uh, you know, I, I don't want to repeat my answer, but what I just answered to Justice Kafka's question is they were trying to use those time frames to show that they're trying to capture permanence. They're trying to capture long term and not that somebody, um, you know, uh, took a job uh, as wrapping gifts for Christmas for five days, um, but no less or no longer, right? They're, they're trying to capture this permanence by that. That's what those dates are good for. But when it comes to figuring out which address you have to register, those dates don't help us. We have to figure out in the context of each case, is this the kind of permanent address that the, this, the legislature was trying to capture? I mean, we have, there are two, two related issues. I mean, the, the, the term employment is a defined term, I believe, correct? It, yes. Yeah, so, and that speaks about 14 days uh, right. uh, if it's to be consecutive and 30 days if it's sporadic. Uh, right. Does that include weekends? I mean, if it's... Um, <laughs> Uh, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know, um, right? Because most of us work Monday through Friday, so I'm, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. Uh, let me speak of this. By the way, this obligation is not only for level two and three; it's for level one, isn't it? it yes. This is right. Anyone, any level has to register that address. The question is, um, uh, you know, what is done with that information once it's registered. Right. So the term work address is not a defined term. They just use, they just, that's just the language they use in the statute. They say you must report your work address, correct? Uh, well, I, I think they, they, they use work and employment interchangeably. I, I think that's their intent, but the, the, it, it's defined employment means than the time gate that you're on referenced. Okay, but the term work address is elsewhere in the statute that what you must report. It, the, the, the term used is, is work address. C correct. Correct. I, I I read that as either sloppy drafting or they're just using work and employment interchangeably. They meant employment address, employment as defined by the statute. So let's assume that you have a uh, let's assume it's a level one. Uh, if that person goes to a is, is in college, do they they need to report their residence? Correct their what dorm they would be living in, that would be their residence that, that must be reported? I, I would think so, yeah. Okay, and then, but they also must report that they're going to university. Correct. So, But they would simply have to report the university thing. They wouldn't have to tell them which particular, what classes they have or where they're going. They would That's my understanding. Like, right. right. The university of Massachusetts, Boston is uh -huh. what you would have to report. Uh, and uh, the, if you're a level one, your work address then goes to SOAR, but is not publicly revealed, correct? Correct. Uh, so for level ones, going to Justice Kafka's point, reporting it, as the Commonwealth says, would have no 
wouldn't be able to inform his family and Lynn that the person is a sex offender because there wouldn't be any reporting. Correct. No, the same way no one would be able to report his address of where the person resides or goes to school for that matter. Okay. So, and if it's level two, that they could, that's of course internet, and if they wanted to hire somebody, they could check out the person and see whether or not that person is, uh, is a sex offender. Correct. Uh, if, 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 if we do what the Commonwealth says, that the work address, is that, if it's level two, is that posted? Would that mean that the Lynn family would be, then be seen as the employer of a sex offender and that would be publicly available to everybody? That is my assumption. If, if, if you make someone like Harding register that address, then that Lynn address would come up for those, that whatever time period is up there as his place of, a place of employment, a secondary place of employment, I guess. So the internet dissemination, I've not looked at it for a while, but that includes not only that, that Mr. Smith is a sex offender, but also that Mr. Smith resides at this address or goes to university at UMass or is presently working at these location, at this location or these locations. Yes, it disseminates any addresses, so primary, secondary work, and uh, although I haven't seen it, I presume it, it disseminates in, 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 uh, university information too. Think. Okay. Uh, I have no further questions. Are there any questions that follow up on the questions that have been asked? Um, I, I, just one follow up on the chief's question. This is Judge Clapper again. So, um, so the Wynn family. So you've got again the Wynn family hires this person, and how would it be listed that? That there, that there, would it be listed that this particular person was employed in the house? I'm just trying to understand how that would be publicly understood. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if, if I missed a little bit of your question because it went out or you just paused, but I think what your question is, what does it look like if it's published? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, this, I mean my, my, this, so say you're wrong in the, the Lynn family, I mean, this person would have to list his work address as the Lynn family. I'm trying to understand what, sure. when the Lynn family's neighbor looks looks and sees this, would it list just the house as having a sex offender or would it list the house as employing um, your client in there? It, it would list the address. It would list the address, and then it would be listed as an employment address for my client. So if you go online and you look somebody up, it, it'll list whatever addresses they have registered. So if you have one primary residence, it says residence. If you have a secondary address, it says secondary address and then the, the address. If, if, it, if you have an employment address, it's employment and then the address. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, my, I'm mine's more basic. So I'm the Wynn family neighbor. And I look right. at this, I wouldn't think that someone in the Lynn family was the sex offender. I would think that this person being employed as a carpenter was a sex offender. I'm just trying to understand what they would know. You, you wouldn't know what they were doing. It would just say, uh, you know, Harding, employment address, and then it would have that Lynn address. They wouldn't tell you more about what the employment consists of. So it wouldn't say carpenter or duration or anything like that. I got you. Thank you. That's all. Actually, before we leave that point, uh, this Chief Justice Gantz, uh, does the work address give only the address, or does it also give the name of the employer? Um, I don't believe it gives the name of the employer. Um, if, you I, for, uh, if, you, if you work for Raytheon, it wouldn't say Raytheon? I... I off the top of my head, I'm not sure, um, but but it is publicly. I mean, you can do a search um, at any point and, and see for yourself how it lists it online. Are there any further questions? And hearing none, Mr. Nadeau. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court, Stephen Nadeau, on behalf of the Commonwealth. Uh, I begin just by noting that the statutory scheme here. Uh, treats residential and employment addresses similarly. Section 178E describes an offender's duty to register uh, the places he resides. Uh, or Could you get closer to the phone, please? You're hard to hear. I'm sorry. That's better. Took it off speakerphone. How's that? That's better. Better. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So again, just to begin again, the uh, statutory scheme treats residential and employment addresses similarly. Section 178E describes an offender's duty to register the places he resides or intends to reside. In the same terms, it describes uh, an offender's duty to register the places he works or intends to work. Uh, and Section 178C defines employment and secondary residential addresses in the same kind of terms, uh, consistent with an apparent uh, intent that the oversight authorities, whether SORB or local police departments, uh, should know uh, where these offenders, given their risk of recidivism, uh, they want to know where they're spending their time, uh, where are you living, where are you working, um, where are you residing. And again, that's consistent with the intent as described uh, by this court in Doe versus Sex Offender Registry Board in 2006. Um, and it's also consistent with the way that the court has interpreted the uh, duty to register employment, um, even if it's burdensome or yields harsh results, uh, for instance, for the homeless or for those uh, vacationing um, in the Berkshires. Um, I don't see any uh, indication in the language that the two should be treated differently. Um, again, the court has applied one uh, interpretation to uh, secondary residences based on the languages that are similar throughout the scheme. It seems that employment addresses should be treated uh, or interpreted and applied in the same way. Uh, turning just briefly to the, uh, again, we concede that the evidence here was insufficient to show a knowing um, violation of his duty to register that employment address, uh, but on the last issue that the uh, offender or the defendant violated his uh, condition of working with children, or not to work with children, um, again, the panel sort of recognizes the record here is limited. It's hearsay. Um, a lot of it kind of on paper, through the probation uh, department mostly. Um, but the Commonwealth position is that the uh, judge here made a reasonable decision that the evidence supported uh, the finding that he had worked with children in violation of that condition. I'm just noting a couple plus factors uh, to, to distinguish it from instance or had he been working as like a busboy in a restaurant, encountered, encountered a family by mistake, and sort of that the extent of it. Uh, here the uh, defendant was uh, returning to the same place after knowing a child was present on the premises. Um, he never made any attempt to you know, clarify what his responsibilities were. He continued um, apparently to work numerous days um, on site with the child present. And the record does have some indication that uh, when he wasn't sure or felt comfortable asking, for instance, as to his duty to register the employment address, he did so. Uh, there's nothing like that here. He just continued to, again, uh, work on site occasionally. Uh, there's some indication in the house while the child was, or the infant was present. Um, and again, the court will just have to decide whether that's sufficient under the circumstances uh, in light of the record. And that's essentially my opening remarks. Okay, Justice Link. Well, I'm going to go to the same question I had before um, uh, as to the uh, the fact that the, there's nothing to do with establish knowingly as to the first probation violation, whether you agree with that, your confession that there is not enough evidence as to that. What is the, what is the uh, implication of that? Uh, and, and just to clarify, as far as mootness? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think arguably it would moot it if there's no live issue. However, uh, the issue having been uh, fully briefed and now argued this morning, um, I, I do think the court is in a position to decide the issue um, that consistent with its own precedent. You, there are mootness concerns, and given the sort of uh, fact that we have interpretation of one prong of this scheme for residential addresses, um, but there's sort of a lack of clarity persisting for the employment addresses. Um, it makes sense for the court to sort of resolve that ambiguity. Yes, but not as this defendant. I'm sorry? Not as this defendant, however. This defendant is free of this, right? Correct, correct. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, I have nothing else. Justice uh, Gaziano. Right, thank you. Uh, just one point. You opened by saying that uh, the statutory scheme is very similar with respect to residential address and work address, but as far as I read, maybe I missed something. Residential address 
it specifically provides for a secondary address, right? And that's the Berkshire vacation. Correct. Home, correct. But work address does, doesn't have similar language. And and I, again, acknowledge that uh, sort of wrinkle or, you know, apparent discrepancy as far as residences versus employment. Um, but I think a lot of people might understand residence to mean almost domicile. Where do you live? Where is your house? Not, um, for instance, if I stay at my sister's house, help out with my nephews four days non-consecutively in a month, uh, I would think of that as my residence, but under the uh, statute it may qualify. Uh, whereas employment, it's more common for people to have multiple jobs, multiple places where they're working that they would have to register. But it, it does also show a legislative intent to be more specific with respect to residential, because we're going to have to construe this against the government, correct? It's a punitive statute. Correct. Those are all the questions I have. Justice Louis. Thank you. So um, I understand why we would want uh, to, to know if, if somebody's you know, painting inside of um, a, a home and the teenagers coming home you know, alone at quarter to three every day. We'd, we'd, we'd like to... Um, not have somebody who's been convicted of numerous uh, stranger sex offenses in the house at the same time. But why isn't that addressed through a condition of probation of stay away from children rather than interpret the issue of working with children, not to mean working in a daycare center or working uh, in other environments where there's you're obviously going to be working with children, but meaning working with children there's a child that happens to be present. There's an infant that happens to be in the house with um, uh, the infant's mother, and uh, the person working is working outside, replacing windows. Uh, can't we address um, the concern through another condition of probation rather than have this uh, expansive definition of what working with children means? I think absolutely. Um uh, the town would be much happier had the judge provided more specific or expansive um, phrasing of the condition. Um, but again, we're kind of left with the condition we have here and the record we have here. But I, I think at, at some point our concerns are, are, are similar to what uh, the question articulates is uh, the idea of someone um, doing carpentry in the summer months, maybe when kids are home from school, um, a, and maybe a Comcast technician who is reports for a call for service fixing um, cable internet connection in a teenager's bedroom uh, that would not qualify um, as like a one-time show up for the employment uh, registration requirement. Um, but a judge who orders a defendant not to work with children could not have had in mind that they could perform this kind of work with this kind of intimate access uh, to children, and that's sort of the concern our position is trying to um, articulate, I guess. Well, I, I, I understand the concern. I just don't see how um, that, that contemplates working with children. But I, I want to ask you one last question, please, about uh, the concern about uh, 14 consecutive days, or maybe even thir more than 30 days. So um, how is the um, employee, um, employer, uh, supposed to really know? Um, what if they're painting a house in April and, gee, I think this is going to take um, eight days, and all of a sudden it's raining like crazy, and it takes um, 14 and a half days. Um, uh, are they um, breaking the law because they've uh, failed to register? Well, I think, I think as far as I understand it, the consequence uh, for failure to register is the exposure to the failure to register statute. And whenever the duty to register may have technically clicked in, we'd still then have a uh, problem with the knowing element. Um, and so that might uh, cover the person who finds themselves on a job site that may have been able, supposed to last 10 days, um, but has gone beyond um, 
sort of unplanned extension of work, uh, similar in the same way, just the example I used, if I am not expecting to um, stay over at my sister's house to take care of my nephews at the beginning of the month for four nights that month, but it ends up happening, um, I think the duty and the criminal liability would attach at the point you recognize uh, that you've passed that point where you have to register. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, did you, I don't know if you explained this earlier. I might have missed it. If the person does register the place of a, you know place where they're working, and it shows up on the registry after they finish the project, would it come down? Uh, off and, the and, uh, registry, you know, off the uh, database. I mean, certainly, I, if I were employed, oh, I'm only asking employed. if you know. I mean, if you don't I know, don't I know. I'm not. I'm not sure. I think if you know, hopefully, the offender could change the address, remove it from his registration. Okay. The work is complete, and then it would no longer appear. All right. And then, um, I, just to be clear, you are. I thought you said to Justice Lowy that you just want to get clarification on what WIF is, what with working with children is. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what. Well, my point is only um, I thought you said that it could have been clearer what what was meant by working with children. But, I, I, yes. yeah, so, so, again, Commonwealth in an ideal record would have, you know, had a more, now, can't do any work with children, involving children to bring you into right. uh, proximity of children, but here we just kind of have the straightforward, uh, cannot work with children. Um, and, again, we're, we kind of are uh, defending the judge's uh, finding is reasonable based on, again, the concern that... Uh, Defendants should have known that uh, this is not what the sentence and judge intended. Uh, that there's not some exception that allows you to work essentially with children uh, just because your work doesn't directly involve them. The same way that I guess a school janitor, uh, that's a little different to not working directly with children. Huh. Okay. But it is probation, obviously, that brought the brought the violation to the court's attention. Now exiting Ellie Cipher. Oh, that's not that's not good timing, is it? Because I'm done. <laughs> okay, we'll have to wait for a moment for Justice Cipher to return. Perfect. Nobody text Justice Cipher and tell her we lost her. Uh, Justice Cipher said she's having a technical problem, and um, we should skip over her. Okay, we'll do so for now. Justice Kafka? Um, so, uh, I'm following up on some of the points uh, Mr. Tennant made. When would they have to register? So, I've got some guy working on my house. Um, he thinks he's going to get it done um, in less than two weeks, but... It's like all construction, it never finishes on time. When, does he register on the, as he, when he realizes that he's going to go over 14 days? 
Does then does that serve any purpose? Because the first ten days he's there without registering. So how does that work? Well, I get well. Does it serve any purpose? I guess depends on how long over the 14 days it's going to go. Um, but as I see the statute, I don't know that there's a wiggle room. But once it's apparent it's extending past that point, certainly I think uh, even if it's only be a couple more days, for a couple more days, um, that address should be registered. Mm -hmm. And so he has, what does he do? So he's a guy, he's a handyman, and he just moves from job to job. What does he list as his, what does he do? What is he supposed to do? Uh, in, in terms of dealing with... Well, I mean, like, so he, you know, one day he's fixing a sink, the next day he's, you know, doing a deck... Does he just list his, his home address? Is his? I'm just trying to understand how this works. Um, a guy guy specializes in doing decks, which takes you know, not like a three hour job, but it's a you know, it's a job that you know t takes a while. Does he keep changing his address? I, I guess I suppose he would have to, just given. Um the statute, I don't think the statute intends to allow people to kind of escape the registration requirement just because their job site keeps changing as long as it's over statutory time. And, and, and so let, how about a landscape? Now joining, Ellie Cipher. I'm, look, I'm looking out my window and I see guys working on my neighbor's lawn. Uh, and they have, do they list 30 different sites if they have 30 different, you know, they, they work for two hours, 30, for 30 days at 30 different places. Do they list all of those as their work site? Or can they just list their employer? So I think in that case where you, you know, landscaping several weeks of the summer might not add up. Um, well, say it does. They, uh, these guys show up pretty regularly. Um, uh, and so do, does every landscape company have to, everyone who works in a landscape company list every single job they have that they go to the site more than 30 times? That would be uh, my uh, interpretation of the statute. Wow, that's and again, I, I think I, I don't, I, I don't think it's convenient, I, <laughs> but I, right. I think that's the balance. The statute, the legislature struck in drafting it this way because, again, the intent it, apparently from the legislature is to know where these offenders are spending their time at home. So, I, and I've got a guy who's a snow removal guy, and it's a, a bad winter. They're going to list every one of their clients if they think it's going to be 30 days of snow removal? Uh, my answer to that would be yes. I, I guess, I, as, again, as I read the statute, I don't think it defines a work day. Um, 178E kind of uses work and employment interchangeably, suggesting kind of just our colloquial idea of what work is. Um, right. If you work at a location I, over the time frame, I think you have to register it. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Justice Cipher, welcome back. Do you have any questions? No, I'm all set. Thank you very much. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I've got a, uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, you uh, concede that there is no violation of the uh, of the uh, SORP requirement with regard to work address because uh, either the probation officer or the attorney told him that that's what he had to do. Uh, the, right. the, 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 with regard to the probation condition, that too has to be a knowing violation, does it not? Yes. Uh, so how do we say that it's a knowing violation given the language that the judge used to describe it? And again, it's kind of the sort of colloquial or everyday understanding of what working is and that a defendant and the or offender in the defendant's position should know that the judge did not 
intent that he should be able to perform that kind of work in such, in such, excuse me, uh, close proximity to a child. Okay, but in this, in this context, I gather the child was an infant? Yes. Was the child born at the time the work began? Uh, as the fact came in, there's sort, of, there sort of like two phases of uh, work the defendant performed. He was hired for initial, an, excuse me, an initial series, and then hired later on to do some more work. Um, and it's in that second chunk that the child had been born and was present throughout. So he's supposed to know that the prohibition against working with children means that he now can no longer perform this job because the woman who resides in the house has had a baby. And, well, I'm not sure what the... Uh, again, the Commonwealth's concern here is uh, that a defendant wouldn't think this was except or the idea that the defendant would able to be able to access such an intimate look at the child's home, but not at school, kind of yields a weird result um, if it only means their work, their job directly involves children. Well, I mean, there's a difference. You recognize there's a, I mean, there are times in which you would say, I don't want you to be working any place where there are children. I mean, that's not an yes. unusual condition. Uh, and there are conditions which say, we don't want you to be working with children. We don't want you to be a camp counselor. We don't want you to be a little league coach. Uh, those are not unusual conditions, but they're different conditions. Yes. Uh, so why should, the, why, should, why should we say that this defendant should have understood that this was the first and not the second, when the judge used the language of the second? Again, I, I, I think it kind of comes down to that question of would a reasonable person in the defendant's position believe this is work they were allowed to do? Um, were they allowed to be in such proximity to children with their work? Um, in the Commonwealth position, uh, apparently consistent with the uh, deciding judges that in this circumstance it was reasonable. Okay. Uh, going to the pragmatic uh, work address, it, or it, does uh, the store periodically uh, send correspondence to the work address? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure, Your Honor. Uh, I, have, I think I have no further questions. Give me one moment. Uh, and I, I don't have any further questions. Are there any questions of any of my fellow justices? And uh, hearing none, uh, we shall conclude uh, this oral argument. And it's now noon, and we will convene our uh, sample at 12.05. So we'll take a five-minute break. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.